still warning. <laughs> I've been asked to uh, come along today to talk to you about BS11000. Uh, can I just ask for a quick show of hands? Who has heard nothing or very little about BS11000? Fantastic. <laughs> exactly what I wanted to see. Good. I can carry on. When I was asked to uh, talk today, I wasn't quite sure whether BS11000 and collaborative working was going to fit with a health and safety agenda. And I thought, well, health and safety. We have demonstrated earlier on about the figures and quite where we are with regard to progress and reducing accidents. But things are perhaps getting better, but we could, we, we could do better. How are we going to make that step change towards really making a big difference on it? Do we need to start working with other organisations, picking the best from different organisations, pooling talent and resource even more than we're doing at the moment. I'll leave that idea floating with you and I'll go through this and maybe you could just think about that as we're going through. <clears throat> okay, who are Costain? Uh, Costain are a billion pound turnover organisation. We used to be construction and engineering, but now we're solution providers because we do loads more than just engineering and, and building. We work within rail, highways, power, airports, nuclear, oil and gas, and water. So within that, lots to do. That's who cost they now. So what's BS11000? Well, BS11000 is something introduced in 2010. So it's relatively new. And it's a standard for establishing and improving collaborative relationships in organisations of any size. Somebody is... Somebody mentioned to me earlier on, collaborative working, is that a thing then? I said, yeah, it is. It, it is a thing. Somebody has actually put down and tried to define exactly what collaborative working means. Partnering was a phrase that we used in industry for many years. And we'd come together and we'd say, we're partnering with, with you. What does partnering mean? Does that mean having a charter or not having a charter? What exactly does it mean? So what these guys have tried to do is define, this is what you do if you want to work collaboratively with somebody else. It's talking about relationships between organisations, not relationships between individuals. When two organisations come together and say, you know what, let's work together. They're having discussions on the golf courses, they're talking about what they can do together. That's a personal relationship, it's not an organisational relationship. I've got a relationship with John Lewis. I don't know anybody there, but I've got a relationship with that organisation. I know when I go along to see them, they'll treat me with respect, the staff will be knowledgeable, and if I've got a problem, they'll generally deal with it no hassle. And it doesn't matter where I go, my interaction with that organisation, I can trust. And that's what this standard is trying to do. It's trying to take the individual relationships out, so it's organisations are less reliant on individuals getting on, but making sure that when they touch, when they work together, they just click, they know how each other are going to work. That's sort of what this is. A short history. Uh, the Confederation of British Industry set this up back in 1990. It was working, uh, it set up an organisation called PSL. Um, they changed their name a couple of years ago to the Institute for Collaborative Working. And they really took all the good practice about how organisations come together and work and they put it into a thing that they call CRAFT. Now CRAFT was developed into a publicly accessible specification in 2007 and in 2010 that became a British standard, a British standard for collaborative working. Costain got their certificate in uh, 2012 and that's actually going on, it's going to become an international standard. 2015, 2016. So this is not going away. This, this is something that is out there for us all to be able to use. I think it's a really helpful standard, but um, I'll try and convince you. So when we first heard about it, we, we heard collaboration. Fine, we know about that. Cost they do that. We've been doing it for years. We work with joint venture partners, customers, got lots of people that we've got really good relationships with. So. Yep, we do that. It should be easy. Uh, actually, no, we 
didn't do it quite as well as the BS requires. Now, the British standard is pretty prescriptive. It requires that you meet 79 criteria. You didn't know this when you go home and talk to your spouse that a successful relationship actually requires 79 <laughs> things that you need to do. Some of you thought there were more, weren't there? <laughs> but there are 79 things within the standard that an organisation has to comply with. Now, there are lots of things that we don't routinely do. We, we normally do a lot of good practice. When we choose to work collaboratively with another organisation, we normally do a lot of good stuff. But some of the things that we weren't doing are these. Regularly assessing cultural fit. We weren't regularly doing that. Agreeing people's collaborative skill sets before we start working with them to make sure that we don't put the Rottweilers in the pit with everybody else. To regularly monitor the health and trust of a relationship. Well, as long as we're not going to court, let's assume that everything's okay. That's not quite what the standard is, is after. It's after you to go a little bit more detailed, and perhaps a little bit more formalised. Everything, the whole history of a relationship is documented in a thing called a, an RMP, a Relationship Management Plan. And that's open to both parties. It's not written by one and read by the other. They develop it together because it's an agreement. It's almost like um, a voluntary code of conduct that two organisations or more enter into in order to both get something out of it. So perhaps we weren't quite as good as we thought we could be. This was new to us. Um, collaboration as a phrase or a term has, has been around since the 1870s in the English dictionary. So it's been around for a lot longer than BS 11,000. So we already had an understanding of what the term collaboration meant. When BS 11,000 came along, that changed that. What we used to understand as working collaboratively is now upturned a little bit. So the British standard now defines for us what collaboration to British standard to BS 11,000 means. Because there's a range of collaborative behaviour. At one end, you may well have a favourite person that you keep going back to, working on with time and time and again, because we get on. It may be a you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back type of relationship. And that's fine. Collaboration can mean that. It could be that you come towards this end of the range and you're talking more about, let's have a co-located team in an open plan office with fleeces that have all got the same logo on them. And that's more towards this end. But BS 11000 at the moment is the gold standard of collaborative working. Much more demanding. What it's looking for and what it's based upon is this. Having a shared objective. Now a shared objective, you don't have to share all your objectives. If Costain have got a list of requirements or objectives that they want to achieve, both as an industry, as an organisation, and on a contract, that's fine. And maybe the partner that we're trying to work with has got their own objectives for their company and their project. But where we overlap and we share a common objective, which may well be to improve health and safety, that might be something that we both really want to do. But maybe we could pool our resources, pool our energies, and do that together and maybe have this as a framework to help to do it. This for me is helpful. Um, it, it helps put collaborative working into some sort of context. It's not specifically from BS 11,000. Um, I can let you read that. And as a tip, read it in American accent. It tends to work. sense, I hope you'll agree, but and the American accent works, doesn't it? Yeah. But what that, what that says to me is, it's about giving something up in order to get something back. And sometimes we don't think about giving something up when we collaborate. We'll pay you money, you just give us what we want. 
Now, what can we give up? Well, really, there are four things that when you're in partnership, you can give up. You could share your information, the data, the stuff on spreadsheets and databases that you've got. All that's secret. We can't share that. Well, actually, some of it might be useful. If you've got data about health and safety and issues that you've had, and somebody else could benefit by understanding that, then why not share it if, it, if you both win? You can share data. You can share methods, your processes, your procedures, your ways of working. One is going to be better than another, but why not pool them and see if you can come up with something that's better than both? You can share your knowledge. We've got a lot of very skilled people in our organisations, and sometimes they're cloaked with secrecy because they're not allowed to talk to the, to the opposition. Well, why not put them together if we can all benefit from that? And people. We can share resources, just pure numbers of people. We do this quite a bit with our joint ventures in some of our sectors because we are not large enough to take on board projects of that size and scale. So we'll boost it by working with another organisation and we'll, together we'll have the right numbers to take it on board. But those are the sort of things that you could consider sharing with another organisation. Okay, so what can we get back? Let's, let's talk a bit more about the benefit that we might get back from this. Reduce cost. We're talking about saving money, saving lives, so great, we could reduce cost. Typically what most contractors or organisations think about when they want to work collaboratively with somebody else. There's a load more of other things you could do. Loads of benefits. You could just have an easier time. New markets. Uh, fewer disputes, business growth, safer, killing fewer people. The point is, you decide what you want out of it first, and then you decide who you're going to work with in order to achieve that. Costain have got BS 11,000 relationships with customers, so upstream if you like, with joint venture partners, and with our supply chain. So it doesn't matter. We have initiated relationships with our customers. We've knocked on their door and said, would you like to work collaboratively? What do you mean? Do you mean sweatshirts and shared office? No. We mean, is there something that we've got in common that we could both sign up to working together? So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is something that helps put, for our people, uh, this into a little bit of context. It helps try and make it a bit more real. What we're all trying to achieve in business and in life is we're trying to achieve results. Now, if results are fewer accidents, then that is, a, that is a result. That just doesn't happen on its own. Results don't just happen. You need to do something before you get a result. Great. I hope I'm not going too far. I'm teaching you to suck eggs on this one. Of course it matters. You've got to do stuff and then you get results. The Enlightened Among Us will do a little bit of planning beforehand. We'll step back and consider the best option out of a range of options and then have actions that will deliver that and will get results. Great, Dave, you're not telling people anything they don't know. In order to get the best options around the table, you need to create the right opportunity for people to share openly best suggestions. You need to create an opportunity where people feel that they can openly put on the table things rather than keeping them secret. In order for people to say, OK, yeah, why don't we share some of our technology? Why not? You need to have a strong relationship. You need to know that you're working for something together <coughs> and that you are not going to be stabbed in the back or treated inappropriately if you start to share this sort of thing. One of our guys said, this makes me feel a bit vulnerable. And, and it can do. It can, as long as, if you don't have a strong relationship, it can, it can make you feel like that. So what do you need to not feel vulnerable? What do all relationships need to really work successfully? You got it. You got to have trust. You've got to have confidence that other organisations are going to treat you appropriately. You've got to understand, be clear on, on how things are with each other. Now trust, somebody once said to me, trust comes from how you are with each other when things go wrong. 
So when things go wrong, what do you do? Do you go to your lawyers? Do you get your claims guys in? Do you, do you start sending nasty letters? Or do you work your way out of it? You can normally gauge whether or not you trust somebody. And that comes, trust comes from behaviours. In other words, what we say and what we do. That's what Costain have run a, a Costain Behavioural Safety Programme, which gives this definition of behaviour is what you say and what you do. Something that somebody independently can witness. And when people say and do the right things, you develop a certain level of trust. When you've got trust, you have a great relationship, you can create the opportunity for people to pull their ideas and skills and talents. You can pick the best one and deliver it. The idea is to get the bottom of this pyramid as wide as possible. Create the biggest, strongest relationships. Because if you've got a really narrow, thin relationship, then correspondingly, the boxes that sit on top of it are going to be thin as well. You're going to get less benefit if you've got a really shallow, small relationship. Now, BS 11,000 helps to support exactly that. The first bit about the getting people together and picking the best idea and planning it and delivering it, so it's the value creation thing. And we do a lot of this. Construction industry and engineers are great at this. Got people in a room, problem to solve, fantastic, let's get on. What we're not so good at is the bottom part of the pyramid. This bit down the bottom. This maintaining the health of a relationship. Keeping it going, knowing that actually there's benefit in keeping this going, rather than as soon as we fall out, we'll stop and we're going to pick somebody else. Those days have gone. We need to, there's benefit in keeping relationships developing over time and time and time. Most of Costain's work is done on repeat business because we're developing relationships over time. My, my view on this is that the standard says put about 70% of your effort into this bottom part about maintaining behaviour. If you've got a good relationship, you know what? Good things tend to happen. Good ideas tend to rise to the surface. So maybe spend 30% of your efforts in getting the value that you need out of it. What could it look like? We typically like to show our guys this is how it might look. You have two organisations and they'll decide, sorry, the term SER is Senior Executive Responsible. It's a BS 11,000. And that's somebody that is, wants collaborative working to happen, a champion for it. And one organisation will approach another and say, I think if we could work collaboratively on this. I think there's benefit in us doing this. Here's a bit of a business case that we've prepared. Could you validate it? Yeah, that looks great. Fantastic. Let's go for it. Well, let's put together a team of people that are going to manage that. It's called the joint management team. And it doesn't have to be the leaders of a project or a hierarchical thing. It just has to be a group of people, representatives from both organisations, that are going to manage the health of the relationship, going to focus specifically on it. What they'll also do is, well, in managing the health of the relationship, is they will set improvement teams in uh, running. So this, depending on what it is that the relationship is trying to achieve, you will have appropriate improvement teams running to try and deliver that. They will create value and they'll capture and document the value that they're creating. They'll measure it too. And if it doesn't work, then don't do it. If you're not getting value from it, then don't follow BS 11,000. That's the decision of the guys in the joint management team. You don't have to do it. It's one of the few British standards where if your organisation is accredited, it doesn't mean you have to do it everywhere. Costain has got accreditation. We pick and choose the relationships where we choose to operate it. Currently, we've got about a dozen. Ideally, we'll probably have about 20 in the foreseeable future. So. There are costs associated with this. You don't have to do it everywhere. Only where you perceive there to be optimum benefit. So what is the benefit? We've got some great benefits. Here are some intangibles. Relationships, developing quicker. You come together with fresh people. 
this sort of thing helps you explain and explore who's going to be doing what much, much quicker. Get problems discussed and solved earlier, ideas come to the table, but this is all theoretical stuff. You don't want to know about that. You want to know about tangible benefits. How much money does this save? We've got some evidence that says on a relationship that there were 60 fewer roles. So due to a lack of man-for-man -man marking and duplication of roles, 60 fewer employed people there. So that obviously there's a cost impact. We didn't take 60 people away, there were never 60 people there. We just agreed that we didn't need to watch what each other were doing. <coughs> on another relationship, we agreed, out of one of our improvement discussions, somebody said, I've got an idea. And out of that, we prefabricated some sections, including m and &E with steel and cladding, and we halved the amount of time on site. It's probably safer to do it that way too. That last one isn't true. But it'd be great if it was, wouldn't it? <laughs> But that's what people are looking for. The industry and our customers and our clients are desperate to say, if you do this, you'll save that. And it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes it just isn't as easy to prove. But proving a direct link between a benefit, a cause and effect with regard to relationships, how do you know that the discussion would or wouldn't have occurred if you'd had BS 11,000 or not? You don't know. Strong relationships take a lot of time to, to develop. And the standard says on its first page, it says that this is a long-term thing. Don't expect to get benefits straight away. This is about developing benefits over a long term. So don't do it if you're on a six-month contract. The link between cause and effect, as I've explained, is, is perhaps difficult to prove. There's a guy called Malcolm Gladwell. He writes a lot of good books. And he, in his latest one, has said, well, sometimes you just know when things are right. You don't have to have lots of evidence, you just know. So, sometimes rely on your instinct. If it feels right, do it. If it doesn't, don't. You're under no obligation to comply with it. Some top tips from me. Focus on the quality of the conversation. Don't get bogged down in things like certificates. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we got the first certificate on the wall? Wouldn't everybody think we're wonderful? It's just a piece of paper. It doesn't actually make any difference to what you do. So think about the quality of the conversations you're having. As you go through the BS 11,000 process, you have some really good discussions about what are you going to share? What are you not going to share? Who's involved? What sort of objectives are we likely to achieve out of this? What are we aiming to achieve and how are we going to measure that? Those are really great discussions that we don't normally have. Focus on building the relationships and dealing with issues and disputes. Another way, the guy that wrote the standard described this to me as playing poker with your cards face up. Doesn't sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> but, everybody, but everybody knows what's going on. And this is what relationships are about. Focus on building the relationships and the results will follow. And lastly, if the joint management team decide this isn't worth doing, then it's not worth doing. They're the guys that are putting their time and effort into the relationship. They've been given the tools within the 79 requirements of the standard that help them to do all this, so they can decide whether or not it's worth doing. If you're not getting the results that you want, and this applies to anything in life, if you're not getting out of it, what you think you, you, you're entitled to, then take a look at the relationship. Is it superficial? Does it exist only on paper? Are you really doing all of those 79 things? I like this phrase, are you hitting the target and missing the point? So if your organization's objective is to save lives or save money, who else, which other organizations might share that ambition? Which other organisations might be willing to share input, invest in that? Shared data, 
she had people, she had processes. So maybe BS 11,000 could help achieve some of those shared goals. Questions later, I understand. Thank you very much.